Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Seeking Play. My name is Dr. Jane Hessian. I'm Ronan Healy. I'd also like to remind our viewers at home that you can watch our interviews on YouTube and also on Spotify. Now, this week's guest was Dr. Mark Maldorf Anderson. Uh, Mark is an associate professor at the Department of Culture, Cognition and Computation at Alhas University in Denmark. His research focuses on play, risky play and recreational forms of fear in children and adults. Mark is the author of a book called Play, and he's also co-authored a, a number of really interesting research papers. Uh, we've chosen four that we really like. Uh, number one is Play in Predictive Minds, which actually forms uh, the core part of our conversation with Mark. And number two is Play, Reflection and the Quest for Uncertainty. Number three is Getting a Kick Out of Film, Aesthetic Pleasure in Play in Prediction Error Minimizing Agents. And number four, can playing Dungeons and Dragons be good for you? Now, having rewatched Mark's interview, we have picked out three quotes that we really enjoyed that we'd like to share with you. Adult playfulness is the same as child playfulness. Play is a voluntary search for moderate surprises. It is a pursuit of resolving that surprise in a way that is rewarding. Human beings are naturally curious and playful if we're in an environment where those behaviors are supported. And finally, Mark says, play is engagement with the unexpected. So having listened back uh, to the episode a number of times, um, and we're going to go back to the, the first um, quote that, that Jane just read. Adult playfulness is the same as childhood playfulness, because it can be difficult to reconcile with that. When, when Mark said it, it, it's something that we instantly spoke about after, and it's something we've been talking about constantly. Um, so I'm going to read the quote out one more time. Adult playfulness is the same as childhood playfulness. Play is a voluntary search for moderate surprise. It is a pursuit of resolving that surprise in a way that is rewarding. And again, as, as Jane and I have kind of mulled over that, that sentence a number of times, we started to think about the, the double diamond. Again, as much as you like it or as much as it's maligned, the, depending on your, your view, um, you know, it is it is beneficial in, in certain contexts. And we got to think about Mark's sentences and how it maybe applies to, to the double diamond. So if you think about the opportunity space or sometimes described as the problem space, uh, think about a voluntary search for moderate surprise. So like all of us, we're, we're going out there in, in the world, uh, which hopefully is voluntary. It's a voluntary you know, expedition or a voluntary search for moderate surprise. You're going out trying to understand the opportunity space or problem space. And then in, in the solution space, you want to resolve that surprise in a way that is rewarding. So again, just a little reflection. It's not nothing scientific in terms of our, our interpretation of what Mark said and the double diamond. But for us, it's just something that has uh, led us to understand that sentence, that phrase a little bit more and try to connect it to the, the work that we do. Uh, again, as ever, we really, really enjoyed our conversation with Mark and we hope you will too. Enjoy. Take care. Bye, folks. Mark, you are very welcome to the Seeking Play podcast this morning. We are very excited to have you as a guest today. We are huge fans of your work and we are really, really excited to chat all things play with you. Thank you and thank you for having me. We're looking forward to this. Well, Mark, what, yeah, we really, really are. Um, Mark, what we're going to do is I would like to take you back and I would like to get to know little you. So I was wondering, could you share with our viewers what you were like as a kid? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, so I think I was a, a, a pretty nerdy kid um, that enjoyed books <laughs> uh, and uh, fantasy and sci-fi and stuff like that. And I remember that I, uh, I remember that I played, and you know played role-playing games um, or pretend play with my friends until kind of kind of embarrassingly late in a way and we I remember that we that we used to um, hide the fact me and the few other nerdy friends I had in class we we used to hide uh, for the other kids that that we still in fact enjoyed uh, engaging in uh, in pretend play 
uh, we were not ready to to start uh, quote unquote hanging out <laughs> as the other cool kids in in class started to do so 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 there so i don't know so i was kind of a uh, i i kind of stayed in that in that phase uh, for 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 many years compared to at least my classmates at the time I like it. So there's, you know, many different classifications of play and risky play, which is, again, a field of research. It sounds to me like you were doing risky pretend play. Mm -hmm. You're kind of merging them together. It's a bit risky if you're caught pretending. Yes, I, I think you're right. And uh, and I think also the I, I remember we used to construct weapons out of um, out of wood and they were very hard and it, it hurt very much if you got hit with them. It's not like... Uh, you know the kids nowadays they use foam and you know they, <laughs> they take each other's health into yeah. consideration and all that kind of stuff so there was also kind of a risky uh, element there that you could get whacked with a really hard axe <laughs> you know what our, our little our little boy Noah he's, he's two and a half and uh in the spirit of of risky play again from reading your research as well it really kind of brought back to the fore that it's important uh we've given him um hammers that you probably shouldn't get not not oh, not, real. not <laughs> real construction hammers, but like they're made of wood and they're significant in terms of mass. And he's already taken out uh, one flat screen TV uh, a couple of months ago, and the second one has now a big line in the middle of it. Yes. And his daughter, uh, his our daughter, our, our older girl Anna, runs away from him when he gets into a, a temper tantrum. So. We're, <laughs> There's times we're thinking like, oh, I don't know about the weapons so much. <laughs> we're trying to calibrate between safety and uh, and having a television screen as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's the, you, you'll find people that will argue that it's a good idea to give kids uh, um, miniature sized, but real uh, versions of adult tools from a very early age. And that's also something you see. Uh, it's very prevalent in uh, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, for instance, we we did a study uh, once with I think it was like fifty-two hunter-gatherer societies from around the world, where we found that you know it's very very normal to give uh, very young children uh, tools that we uh, at least in the West, in Denmark, and uh, and in the UK would consider to be very risky mm. uh, to give them, uh, but that's that that's normal and and they're. It doesn't seem to be an increase in injury uh, rate with these kids, but I I don't know about I mean, hunter gatherer societies uh, normally don't uh, I I guess have uh, have TVs, so I I don't know what what the the jury is out on that I, I guess, but but in terms of of development, uh, you'll find many accounts that will argue that it's actually a really good idea to give kids these um, these tools. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. it, it goes back to a level of of agency and autonomy and. And, and trust, you know, and, and it works both ways that we can trust ourselves to be parents that allow our kids to engage in risky play. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic, hence all of your work, which again, we're going to link to the show notes. But on, on the theme of kind of risky uh, play, um, are there any bumps, breaks, scrapes, uh, wild adventures um, that you had as a kid that you think contributes to your sense of identity as an adult? I think I, I would then have to say something like on, on the contrary, because I think my, my, my parents were, um, I think, rather overprotective parents when I was a kid. So, uh, so I was not exposed to a lot of, uh, you know, very challenging uh, or sort of, um, yeah, you know, I, I was, I, I remember that I, there was a lot of, stuff again that my classmates were allowed to do you know like riding your bike on your own downtown mm -hmm. uh, that i was never allowed to do sort of un unsupervised um so so maybe uh, so maybe it's it's kind of uh, in, in a way ironic that i now do work on on how important it is to to let your kids fare unsupervised so that they can engage in in risky forms of play and uh, and the ways in which that will contribute positively to their development and maybe yeah. i'm trying to get back at my mom and dad in some way <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah what what did they say uh research is me search yes. yeah probably probably <laughs> yeah yeah i question what 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 are we trying to get to in, in terms of bringing lego serious play to the fore like yeah i probably don't want to think about my childhood too much in terms of uh play and lego um but i'm sure there's something there as well that we're we're trying to scratch some itch from yeah. a childhood event 
yeah, I'm sure. Mark, I would love to chat to you about adult playfulness and what the term adult playfulness means to you. Um, so I think essentially adult playfulness is the same as um, child playfulness in principle, mm -hmm. I'd say at least. Um, so, so we've developed this theoretical um, um, cognitive account of why humans play. And, and I don't think looking at play through that lens, at least that there is in principle any differences between uh, adult playfulness and child playfulness. So, so, so the way we, we define play is that it is, it's a sort of a voluntary search for um, moderate surprise. Uh, and, and it's a pursuit of resolving that surprise in a way that's revo rewarding. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also what adults do. I mean, adults are also uh, very much rewarded by engaging uh, with uh, with new stimuli. You can think of going to a movie you haven't seen, for instance, that's typically very rewarding if it's a good movie and so on. Uh, but the problem is, uh, the problem with adults is that, and we know that, you know, that, that adults play way less than, than children. And we, and that's also the case ac across the, the animal kingdom in the playful species that, uh, that we know of that, that younger individuals will tend to play more than older individuals. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but, and, and I think that there's a few reasons for why that's the case. One of them, uh, in the case of humans is that uh, adults uh, have way more obligations they have less free time than uh, than children do um so we don't have really have time to to engage with uh with all the things that that might interest us mm -hmm. um, and another uh, big part is that, that there's like a you could say like a a, a play taboo um that other adults imposes uh or that adults impose on each other where to some extent adults are expected to not play they're expected to do productive things mm -hmm. with <laughs> with their life functional productive uh things um so there's that um and we can see that you know adults are, can sometimes be embarrassed to engage in in play um, and then, um, the, I, but I think the most uh, sort of important reason for why adults play less than children is that adults know way more than children do. And, and because play is so closely linked to this search for surprises, new information, things we haven't thought about or experienced or encountered before, then it becomes way more difficult as a grown uh, as a grown up adult because you have encountered way more stimuli throughout your life so in other words it's much harder for an adult to find avenues where they will become surprised in a sense mm -hmm. so so and, and and that's why you know that that you know young kids a one year old maybe two year old they can think that it's really fun to play with a water faucet um but adults, especially those of us that have been through a, a COVID uh, pandemic, uh, you know, we hate the water faucet. It's uh, at least it's not <laughs> yeah. it's not fun for us to engage in washing our hands uh, anymore. It's just a functional task. There's no reward or uh, enjoyment uh, associated with it, and that's because from this perspective, that it is simply that the the water faucet is predictable mm -hmm. to us, and it is unpredictable. Uh, to a a young child yeah yeah and and I, I think there's so many again parallels that link to again adult playfulness and serious play yeah, yeah. in in that you're you're trying to uh create one an environment uh that is conducive to feeling safe to put play with ideas and play with concepts and and to go to a topic we'll touch in terms of predictive processing to um to reframe your your technically generative model um, what you perceive to be is the world. You can, with Lego series play, you can build that out and literally look at it 
and and in the act of doing that play with different components and different ways of viewing your role your department your organization and there is then an element of surprise there is a a, a new revealing of of insight um so i think yeah the um like you said they're fundamentally the same it's just mm -hmm. like a novel environment and doing something to match that to create an element of surprise yeah. um, works for kids and it works for adults as well but i think as you said it's the stigma yeah. of play People are happy to talk about creativity mm -hmm. and innovation. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're readily accepted, but play, and that's the premise of this, yeah. you know, the reason for this podcast is to say we've been playing and it's an emergent, creativity is an emergent property of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. play and innovation is an emergent property. So it's a precursor to these brands we've just stamped on what adults do. But I think that that is one of our key constraints as well, addressing that stigma of adult playfulness and the benefits of adult playfulness in the workplace because you know to echo what you said mark there is that direct correlation of playfulness and productivity you know so why would i let my staff you know engage in any sort of play when they can be using their time to be more productive and i think that yeah. that's one of our you know key constraints that we are up against to address that stigma um but yeah. we're, we're getting there yeah. definitely and it's... lego serious play is a fantastic tool to address that mm -hmm. yeah and, and and i think one of the reasons that there's also this sort of uh, uh that people are hesitant that adults become hesitant when we mention the word play is that uh you know some of them have been exposed to like um you know uh, maybe some kind of consultant firm that has to to engage them in playfulness and then that consultant firm that you know that visits their own firm comes along and they say now we have to really play and be goofy and stuff like mm -hmm. that yeah. and they totally misunderstand what yeah. what play is because they yeah. they think that or they would sometimes argue that you know play is about being silly or being yes. not serious or you know doing uh, wacky things like dancing around the christmas tree in august or something like that and and most adults hate that mm -hmm. because it, it's not it doesn't it's the, it they it's, it doesn't reward them it's mm -hmm. not enjoyable and the reason that it's not enjoyable is that it's not surprising at all it's totally utterly predictable and exactly. it has no function right so yeah. I think it's also because you know a lot of adults associate play with mm -hmm. either children's activities which are to them predictable mm -hmm. uh, or just you know playing out wacky pointless. Um, activities uh, which to them as well is very predictable so so it's also about you know i think reframing what play means to a lot of adults and say you know well play in adulthood is actually kind of like hobbies or yeah. things things that you really care about you know a, a movie series you might be interested in that kind of stuff that feeds you with things that um that are moderately surprising to you that you can learn uh from really fast essentially is the point um, of, of that search. Yeah, again, in a complex environment, you need to engage in an act that isn't the same. You need to, there needs to be a shift in pattern to emerge an insight. Mm -hmm. So again, I, this is why we love your, your work in predictive processing, which we will get to. And, and just on training, because I've got some quotes, we've got some quotes. Oh, yeah. um, Actually, yeah, it was training. You mentioned around this one here. This is Mark Beckoff. So we we just for listeners, we have about 15, 16 yeah, quotes. Cool. And you've picked two that resonated with you. Mm -hmm. Play is training for the unexpected. And that's Mark Beckoff. So why did you choose that one, Mark? Well, because it's it's uh, it's a classic quote, and I love the the work by um by Mark Beckoff. Uh, uh and I think I chose it because um one, it's it's very influential quote in research, and and two, uh, I almost agree with it. <laughs> um, so I, if I if if I could like turn back time and and alter that uh, that statement a little bit, I think I would have said that play is um, engagement with the unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, of, uh, and and in that sense, you could say that play is training for future unexpectedness, but. I just think that the quote gets it a little bit backwards in a sense because I don't think that when we when we engage in play and when children engage in play that they are getting more and more ready for stuff they can't predict. Mm -hmm. They are on the what they are doing is engaging with 
stuff that right now to them is unexpected and unpredictable. And of course, that will have eventually have the the effect that more and more things in the world becomes predictable to them. And in that sense, they are training for future unexpectedness. But I feel like the quote could 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 have been altered a little bit. Um, but still, I think it, it comes very close to the uh, to what I think is the core of uh, play as a human behavior. I love that. We're 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 uh, in season two. We're going to harvest some of uh, the quotes from uh, our guests. I think your nuanced one is going to be in there as well. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll check your in with you. We'll, we'll make sure Becca. how we've structured it, gra- mm-hmm. you know, the grammar and syntax and everything. But yeah, let's uh, let's um, uh, playfully uh, challenge Mark Beckoff's quote. It's definitely one of the most popular quotes. Yeah, it? it sure yeah. is. It sure is. And I'd love to hear that you're mm-hmm. saying, you know, there's nuances to it. We can we can interpret it a little bit differently. Our second one, play is our brain's favorite way of learning, and that's Diane Ackerman. So why why was that an important one for you? Well, this so this quote I didn't know uh, in advance, uh, but I but I I think I I agree in uh, I agree very much with it at least in 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 some sense, um, and I think that comes back to the work we've been doing on on predictive uh, processing or sort of how the brain how we think the brain processes information and what that tells us about what play in humans uh, is. Um, and so, so according to, so what, what we think essentially is that the reason play is so fun and rewarding is because, or it is an expression of uh, it being an efficient way for children to learn stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so the argument here is that in predictive processing, you have this idea that the brain is this prediction machine that constantly tries to predict the input um, that comes in from the environment before the input actually arrives. Mm-hmm. So we make all these predictions uh, about how the world is going to behave and then we, in a sense, only afterwards check if those predictions were correct. And some predictions will be right, some predictions will be wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and then the trick here, um, we think, is that what the brain does is that it, it, it actually only cares about where it was wrong. And then it sort of focuses its energy uh, to these what we call prediction errors. Mm-hmm. And... So recently, there sort of emerged a new layer to this theory that says, well, yes, on the one hand, the brain, um, you know, registers the amount of prediction errors that it encounters, but it it also estimates in advance how much prediction error it's going to encounter when it starts engaging with the phenomena. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, uh, guesses how how unpredictable is this thing going to be that I'm going to do now, mm-hmm. um, and then also estimates, you know, how can I how successful will I be in not only encountering these prediction errors but changing them into predictable patterns as well. So this resolvement of surprise, you could say, mm. and we think that the the difference between that estimate when we estimate how unpredictable something's going to be and how well we can resolve this mm-hmm. surprise, the difference between that and the rate at which we actually do convert this unpredictableness into predictableness mm-hmm. is, is what is responsible for creating uh, a sense of joy in us. So in other words, that means that, um, that when we experience enjoyment in play and when children uh, in, uh, experience enjoyment in play that enjoyment is caused by them reducing prediction error faster than they thought they would in other words they are learning faster than they thought they would and yeah. again in other words they are learning you could say surprisingly fast to themselves they, they they surprise themselves with how fast they are able to resolve a situation or learn about a situation and in that sense, I, I think the quote is great that play is our brain's favorite way of learning because in a way it it tells us, um, or at least with the backdrop of this 
cognitive uh, theory, you could say that, well, yes, that, that the brain is sort of uh, made to reward us when we do better than we thought we could. Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of it's sort of telling us, you know, oh, that strategy that you just used when you know when you were uh, trying to figure out what this toy box does or whatever, that strategy was much better than the previous strategies you've you've used. So you should use this going forward. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I, I think that the uh, you know Diane Ackerman's uh, uh, quote uh, also gets very close to 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 something I think that's at the core of play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, like uh, again, we're gonna link your your all your work in, in the show notes. But I remember reading your paper, um, and um, I ended up we we read on a Monday morning uh, anything play related, and uh, Jane is at one end of the desk and uh, I'm at the other, and I started I got so excited about reading pred predictive processing because I was we were like slowly pulling the thread of predictive processing and play, thinking oh we're pioneers here, look at us, and then I was like. Mark Anderson, and there's like three or four of the researchers. And as I was reading it, I wasn't consciously aware of it. I was standing on my chair. I just was getting like so into reading your paper because predictive <clears throat> processing is a wonderful way of framing play. It kind of adds a more, I would say, a serious view, a more, nearly a quantitative view uh, to play. And, and it, it helped then us kind of, I think we under, understood this already, but but it gives language, I think, to say that when we are helping teams scenario test. So they'll build out their, their team, their department, the organization, stakeholders, and you you engage in a series of, of scenarios which are likely or unlikely. And I, I think with scenario testing, don't go more than a year or two or three because you're just into imagination. If you scenario test within that time, it's that, that surprise of testing your predetermined belief around this is our team this is our department and and kind of pushing it and cajoling it it's that release of insight going ah okay if this problem happens next quarter we will learn and they're kind of that's loop that generative model has been tested and people are learning from it so i'm squeezing two things in there one your work on predictive processing and play and two kind of linking it back to us seeing that aha moment of yeah. people having this landscape, this system, and testing it, and then releasing insights. Yeah, and I think you know, I think there was recently a paper about aha moments uh, that I encountered, where they they uh, these authors actually claim that the, the same thing that you know, an aha moment is really when you resolve surprise faster than you expected. You know, all of a sudden, you know, the puzzle falls into place, mm -hmm. and you have this boom rush of, of dopamine or this really really nice feeling uh, in your body because you're doing better than you expected um and so I, I think you could say in some sense that that play when it goes uh, as the organism wants it to go play is a a sort of a string of of, of aha moments um and 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 that's one of the reasons that you know that kids seek play i think they seek it because they uh, they get enjoyment out of resolving uh, unpredictability mm. and um, and the reason kids look for that sort of only moderate surprise in their environment, not too much, not too little, uh, also what's called the Goldilocks principle in mm -hmm. developmental psychology, by the way, is because those moderate um, surprises are the most likely to be the place where you find, you know, the place where you actually resolve stuff faster than expected. If, if, you, in, if you go into, you know, a really complicated unpredictable environment uh, you might not be able to resolve anything uh, at all because you know the the environment is simply too confusing for you um and and you know vice versa if it's too predictable then you you've just found yourself in a really boring environment <laughs> yeah yeah perfect uh okay so mark how do you balance taking your work seriously well it's not taking it too seriously hmm. um I think maybe I don't know in so I think a big part of it is that we have a, a pretty good, I think, in Denmark work life balance. Um so that that's that certainly helps. Uh, so the job does not take up all of our time. Um and I think that is uh, much uh, in a sense much um at least when I come, when I when I talk to American colleagues, I think that that we we are better off uh, here sometimes. Um, and so, I mean, I've been very lucky to be part of um, 
the interacting mind center for uh, most of my career, which is a, a research center here at Aarhus University in Denmark, where, you know, the, I think it strikes a really nice balance of, you know, ambitiousness in academia, but also curiosity and a, a sort of a, a space where you can really pursue stuff that are uh, interesting and um, so so I think I've been very fortunate with the academic environment that I ended up in that really sort of fosters this culture of um, you know curiosity and joy and um, as well as having that other part which is a necessity in academia to also you know push the boundaries of our knowledge all the time and be ambitious about it so, so, so I think those two things uh, combined has helped a lot. <laughs> Lucky you. It, it, yeah. I, again, I would say, I'm generalizing here, but academia is, yeah, you would not naturally think, you know, the, 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 the urge or the necess necessity to get published and be respected in your field, it kind of does orientate you towards a very serious view of what you're doing so that's yeah. lovely to hear the culture is is a, a balance between yeah serious and play and fostering that creativity and innovation which is so important mm. mark i'd like to take you back to when you were first starting your career what advice would you give to your younger self about either being more playful or less serious in the way that you interacted or the way you thought you interacted with um other people well, I'm not sure that I would change that much. I mean, I would, I would urge myself to, I guess, to place myself in, in, in this environment that I that I talked to you about just just before uh, sooner. I, I suppose. I mean, the. I think the work environment matters much more than whatever individuals, whatever strategic. Uh, concerns and reflections the individual might have uh, on their <laughs> in their career um i mean hum humans are i think naturally curious and also playful um if we are in an environment where that is supported so we also know from animal studies for instance that you know Animals, they 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 don't play if they are hungry. They don't play if they're stressed. They don't play if they are wounded. They don't play if. So if if all these if you have these basic needs that are. Sort of that needs taken care of, then, then most organisms, sort of puts puts off, uh, being playful and 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 being curious. Um. So so play sort of this luxury product you could say that in, that emerges from a an organism that is content and and that's why work environments are so it is so important that a work environment you know don't make you stressed or uh, uh, you know remember remember to, to to feed you at lunchtime don't make you work through your lunch and you know all these sort of basic things so 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 I think in a way it it really comes down to having a supportive environment, and I would guess that's the case in 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 you know in in most businesses and in most uh, fields of work. Yes, very true. Um, Mark, how would you explain the work that you do to a five-year-old? So that's very easy, actually. Um, <laughs> you, know, you have many guests on your podcasts, and I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they might they might have a bigger challenge than I do because uh, I I think it's actually easier to explain what I do to 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 kids than it is to adults. Uh, many times, kids tend to instantly uh, get what I do when I say that I do research on children and play, and they are you know they're like what else would you want to do <laughs> research on really yeah. right? So um, so yeah that 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 has never been a problem. That's good. That's a fantastic answer. You, you know what? Yeah, we're, we're, we're starting to see a pattern where the people we interview, they're like, yeah, five-year-olds, easy. Yeah. 
it's yeah. the 25, 35, yeah. 45 year olds. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. where it gets difficult. Yeah. They're a very accepting bunch, the five-year-olds, when it's play related. It would make sense. Well, I think it's like us. I think we're able to explain that we play with Lego. Yeah. <laughs> seven year old but when we're trying to explain it to our in-laws or our parents that's where we uh, sometimes encounter some difficulty so yeah <laughs> definitely <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Mike, I would love to talk to you about your research um, mm -hmm. you are a prolific writer and I would like to chat about a recent paper entitled play in predictive minds a cognitive theory of play so, Mark, could you explain to our viewers what predictive processing is? Uh, yes, certainly. So, so predictive processing is um, is at least sort of in its most ambitious form. The the predictive processing um, theory or framework is a framework that that attempts to to explain uh, human perception, action, uh, emotion, and cognition only via this really only via this one single mechanism that we talked about just earlier um prediction error minimization uh, where where sort of the brain tries to match um or attempts to reduce the mismatch between uh, how it uh, predicts the world to be and how the world uh, actually is and that's sort of the you, you could say that's sort of the the framework that we that we built uh, this cognitive theory of play uh, on, um, and and so and and using that that framework, we we propose that that play is this behavior where you know where organisms, children and adults, deliberately seeks out moderately surprising situations or create them. Mm -hmm. if they are in an environment where there is no uh, uh, surprise and 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 we we argue that that the reason that play is so fun is that is that those are the situations where you successfully reduce this prediction error or this mismatch between the world uh, how the world is and how you predict it to be that you reduce that difference faster than you ex expected Thank Again, you. we're going to link that to the show notes. Okay. But as I was kind of kneeling, standing on my chair, being very, very animated, reading your paper, literally trying to like go into it. I wanted to like dive into it. I end up cheering at the end of it. And I think I emailed you because that's generally what we'll do. I was like, you know, if we this is the as much us interviewing people who've brought us along this kind of play odyssey. Um, but I, I cheered at the end of it. It was like it was a winter's day and it was dark and i just i felt like there was like levity of, of of reading your paper so um again thank you for for you know piecing you know pretty good processing and play together and 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 i'm sure you know you know this it feels like it's only the first of many stepping stones towards linking play with um with this uh view of of um of how the brain thinks um so yeah, you got me to cheer my office on a, on a Monday on a dark, <laughs> on a dark and very boring Monday. So yeah. I want to thank you for that one. I'm very happy. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to read a, a, a few lines from it actually. So, um, and I think it's really important to to explore this. So, uh, this is your quote from the paper: "A predictive processing account of play is supported by recent ideas of childhood as an evolutionary solution to explore exploit trade offs." The problem of finding the right balance between keeping your options open and committing to a particular option. This evolutionary perspective argues that cognition works differently in childhood as compared to adulthood. So I think we've kind of touched on this, but can you explain what is the difference uh, viewed through a predictive processing framework? Mm, yeah. So so um, so this idea that. Um, that cognition works differently in in kids as opposed to adults is, is an idea that has been put forward by um, probably the most influential uh, developmental psychologist in the world, Alison Gopnik, who does amazing work on on play and playfulness. So I can also highly recommend uh, her her work. So the idea here is that you know that that kids are supposed to um, sort of have this. Uh, 
you know being gravitated to whatever they don't understand in the environment and you know that that's why as everyone that has kids or nephews or or or, or children uh, in their lives will know that that especially young children uh, are uh, you know terrible to look after because they will get attracted to almost every single type of new stimuli that uh, that they encounter so you, you better watch out when you have them in traffic or you know if you are if you have the barbecue on or something like that and they, and and and, and Ellison's and uh, Ellison Gopnik's argument is you know that they are made like that for a reason uh, you know the reason is that they have to gather as much knowledge as they possibly can about their environment throughout childhood so that when they become adults they can use that mm -hmm. uh, knowledge so when we you know turn on the barbecue uh, or whatever we do not get burned we know how to 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 flip steaks and so on and so forth um and so so i think that whole um you know that whole shift from childhood to adulthood where you tend to go from uh, sort of a very explorative way of being in the world to a very exploitative being uh, in the world is something that you'll also get out of this predictive processing framework because of the you could say the information constraint that is in the world, right? So, 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 as we talked about earlier, adults will tend to become less playful because there are fewer things to be surprised about as you age. Um, and so, in a sense, you have perfected many of of your skills as you as you um, as you grow older. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, you have, in effect, moved into being exploitative uh, because you have sort of found the optimal way of, of reducing unpredictability in, in many cases in your life and you have habitualized them and so on uh, uh, and so forth. So it, it's not as much from a predictive processing perspective, the case that cognition works differently. Uh, cognition works the, the same way uh, in if you look at it through a predictive processing lens, but the outcome uh, over a lifespan of of the of the actions um, that that you uh, that humans uh, take will change as a consequence of that same principle being being present over time. You will become less explorative and more exploitative within many domains uh, of your life. Mm. Mark, I'd love to ask you about how, well, how do you think the PP framework could help legitimize serious play in organizations, be that in relation to team building, creativity, or innovation? So I, I think what this, so, you know, if, if, if we are right, or, or at least somewhat right on, on this account, I think, I think what is, what it shows is that or what it highlights is that engaging with something that is stimulating and enjoyable uh, are, are great signs that you are maximizing your learning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, so if, if you can somehow foster environments where your whoever you work with feel rewarded and curious all the time, then that's sort of the, you know, the, that's sort of the, the what do you call it, the golden uh, state or the, the, the you know, the, 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 that's the state you, you want people to be in. That, that, that's the sign that they are at least surprising themselves with how uh, efficient uh, they are learning or task uh, resolution uh, is at the moment. So, so I think what it, what it really highlights is is how important it is to be on the lookout for facilitating mm -hmm. uh, you know um, immersed and and engaged children as well as as adults um but i mean you you could get that answer from other accounts as well right uh, so it, it's not like that is breaking news uh, to anyone but 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 that is what i think what what essentially comes out of it and maybe it, you know, it um, 
it, it, it tells us something about, you know, fun is, is, is not the opposite of being serious, mm-hmm. right? For, for fun is exactly being serious about whatever it is that you are engaging with um, if, from, a, from a learning or, or task resolution perspective. Yeah, and and again, so much in, in that, um, and and really, just it's like if if the environment, the business environment, your your organization uh, environment is is constantly in flux and in change. Like a, a good sign of that would be that everyone's busy doing things. If everyone's busy doing things, things are changing in the organization. So therefore, there's a time for you. You should really kind of try and not forever, not always be playful, like you said, dancing around a Christmas tree, but at least, you know, carve out time to try and create novelty, a space and time for novelty to emerge, to try and at least match that environment and to try and consider that environment. Um, and yeah, like even your point of like, I don't think, you know, any of this is kind of groundbreaking, but I, I think going kind of broad on a variety of different perspectives on play, it just gives you different language and different terminology mm. to explain in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, I, I would have thought we were talking about this yesterday that predictive processing feels to us like um, it's a, an innovation framework called jobs to be done. It comes from six Sigma. It's very metrically driven and it's like, Oh, okay. It's kind of like, it's not about empathy and caring and like kind of abstract fluffiness jobs to be done is very, very kind of like you're getting down to a sentence and verb structure and, and predictive processing kind of brings that to play as well. It's like, no, we're, we're trying to like create surprise and novelty to therefore learn. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, uh, predictive processing or anything is is valuable uh, to understand play because it, we, like I think it, you you ended on your paper. There's still a lot a lot more to go to fully understand and and bring play back into. I think the end of your paper. Did you say it's now time to see play as a significant part of developmental psychology or? Yeah, I think that's what got me che- to cheer. I was like, yes, like you know, play is important. Yeah, so historically, play has has uh, not taken up a lot of space in, uh, in you know, if you would buy a, a big volume of how how children uh, develop, play would uh, rarely be uh, even mentioned yeah. in some of those books. That's luckily changing. I think over the, over the last ten years or so, there's been a lot of new research uh, out on play, not only in developmental psychology but also in you know anthropology, even archaeology. Uh, that's uh, are starting to take an interest in um, in 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 how children play. Yeah. Um, okay, that's my question. Woo-hoo. I could talk to you forever. Like I literally, do you want to move to Ireland? And <laughs> hang out with us? This is I just this is wonderful. Um, so we did say you're a prolific writer. We weren't we weren't just making that up. And we're going to jump to another paper which we really enjoyed as it relates to risky play. And we, mm. we mentioned it already. It's entitled "Playing with Fear." A field study in recreational horror. That's a, that's a great title for any <laughs> academic paper, first off. So in the paper, you discuss recreational fear. Can you explain what is that and why it's an important topic for to research? Yeah, so um, so so this is sort of uh, I guess uh, a part of my research that is fairly uh, recent. Um, but I I started hanging out with this dude called Matthias Claesen, and he is, uh, he's an associate professor here at Aarhus University as well. And he is a horror researcher. And we got to talking at some point and, um, you know, we started talking about horror uh, as something that, you know, should probably be seen as playful engagement with fear. Right, because it's something that people do voluntarily. They they even pay money to go to the <laughs> to movies uh, to get scared, for instance, or a haunted attraction. Um, and they, on the one hand, feel this really unpleasant valence uh, in them, whilst also feeling, you know, great enjoyment from from that. Maybe something akin to bungee jumping. Uh, or something like that, right? So, so, so we got together and 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 decided to do this study about the relationship between fear and enjoyment, in um, and and sort of trying to to ask, can we can we think of of recreational fear as a form of playing with fear? 
Um, so, so we went to, to a haunted attraction where we, uh, so this haunted attraction is, is in Vejle, it's called, uh, Vejle is a city in Denmark, um, and the, the place that we went to is called the Stobia Haunted House, and it's this sort of big haunted attraction that that sort of takes place in a, in a, in a closed down fish factory, like this old fish factory. It's really, it's a really creepy, scary place uh, in the middle of the woods. And um, and they have, I think, 70 to like 100 scare actors that will be sort of hiding in this big factory. And then participants will come pay money to get in there and get scared uh, by dressed up zombies and, um, you know, people, mania, uh, chainsaw wielding maniacs and stuff like that inside of this haunt. And so what we did was we, 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 we put heart rate monitors on these poor guests. And then we um, we sent them through the haunt, and then we asked them how enjoyable they thought it was and how scary they thought it was. Um, and just to preface, this is a really scary <laughs> place. I think around like five to ten percent of all of their guests uh, can't um, complete the attraction, and okay. so have to sort of stop on the way. Uh, so, so, so it is <laughs> it's really scary. Uh, but what we found was a precisely the relationship you would expect if if uh, horror is a form of play and that is sort of this inverted u-shaped curve between fear and uh, enjoyment meaning that moderate fear is what elicits the highest rating of enjoyment mm -hmm. if it becomes too scary people's enjoyment rating decrease or and but if it's not scary enough it also decreases right um so um so I think that that is, and and we, by the way, we found the same pattern with with heart rate. So, so very large fluctuations over time in heart rate um, would be associated with people reporting that they were very scared. Whereas these sort of moderate uh, differences from the normal state, uh, the, the normal physiological state of participant, would correspond to people saying that they really enjoyed being in the haunt so 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 you could almost say that you know that 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 humans as organisms you know dislike being very far away from their normal state mm -hmm. uh, but we we actually quite like being a little bit outside of our normal state that's really rewarding to us um so yeah so so so, so that paper sort of links i think uh, the research on play with uh, research on uh, on these more what we traditionally think of as negative uh, emotions and also this whole field of of risky play which is um, something that we are increasingly uh, getting into um, also with colleagues from the uk i am dying to know mark did you encounter any difficulty getting this research past the ethics committee or did, did this did this have to go through the ethics board or did you encounter uh, difficulties pre pre research we get that question a lot yes uh, but the, the way the um the way the rules are in denmark is that um you do not need a, a, an ethical uh, clearance when you do this kind of research because it is not um well mostly because uh, that we are not creating this scary environment at Aarhus University. We are wow. just going and observing something that people are doing already. So, okay. For observation. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fantastic. There's a real <laughs> academic question here. So, no, just so <laughs> wait, wait. I love it. I like it. I encountered many, many applications that were refused along the way with yeah, cool. some of my research. So yes, I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, yeah, we're currently engaging now in, in 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 research projects that have a way more medical nature. Okay. Um, where we are looking at um, the relationship with with fear and inflammation reduction, oh. uh, and 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 that does uh, require <laughs> extensive, uh, yes. um, you know, ethic ethical uh, approval. I'm I'm fascinated. Can we get like a brief on that? The fear. So being afraid reduces inflammation. Did I pick up 
That is one hypothesis that wow. being scared can re can reduce low grade inflammation. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we had a doctor friends, doctor colleagues, that <laughs> medical colleagues that know way more about this than we do. Yes. Um, but the idea, I think, is that um, a lot of uh, quite a lot of people uh, go around with a little bit of low grade inflammation in their body, and and that's very unhealthy. Um, and we know that the adrenaline system uh, kicks off uh, or, or creates inflammation. So when we get scared, inflammation sort of really kicks off in our body, presumably to, I think, um, prepare the body for a trauma. Mm -hmm. right? so it's a good thing that you have a lot of inflammation if you, have, if, if you suffer a trauma, because inflammation is sort of what helps you uh, close the wound essentially yeah, yeah, that's yeah. also why you sort of get red around a wound uh, right if you if you've suffered um, suffered damage so so when we get scared that system activates even before we are hurt and it, and uh, and in some cases you um oh i guess that well that's the question so the question is can this natural activation of the adrenaline system and the inflammation um curve sort of resolve low-grade inflammation so mm -hmm. if you have that spike of inflammation that is a natural sort of response can that natural decline of um of inflammation sort of pull down with it that low-grade uh, inflammation and 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 there are some studies that indicate that you can get sort of that effect by um by taking uh, ice Ice uh, yeah, I was yeah, just going to say, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's sort of following or, or dabbling a little bit in, in, in that area as well. Yeah. Uh, and, that's, and and ice ice uh, plunges also do activate the adrenaline system. Yeah. As you were talking, that's what I was thinking about, you know, yeah. based ice plunges, which are, you know, they're so popular now worldwide, um, thanks to Wim Hof. But yeah, the, the, that, that does make sense. You yeah. know? The one gripe I have, about um people call it now wild swimming oh yeah and that's just called swimming outdoors or sea swimming <laughs> like you're like it's not wild that's just outside mm -hmm. what what how did that become wild I, again i would think is partly is how detached we have become from our natural environment and mm -hmm. play being a part of our natural way of being in the world you use the term and i love that it's a part of your being in the world i think we've detached ourselves from adult playfulness and even adults playing outdoors not the wild it's not wild swimming. <laughs> it's just swimming <laughs> yeah it's kind of the same you know with, with risky play that term risky play and, yeah. and a lot of, uh, some researchers are, are advocating to change that term to adventurous play because it's really not that risky uh, yes. it's just us you know overprotective parents that thinks that it that it is risky uh, but but kids rarely get hurt when they engage in in risky play because they're really good at calibrating what they can do and what they cannot do absolutely and look you learn pretty quick when you take a fall yes. you know and you, or you, need a stitch. <laughs> you know that's a one heck of a way to learn quickly yeah. so mark final question um do you do you think it's possible for organizations to embed recreational fear or elements of it into their routines or habits mm -hmm. as in like would it benefit creativity or innovation or or team cohesiveness <laughs> i'm really pushing I, you on this one yeah no i think not i think i i i won't advise uh, having <laughs> a, a chainsaw wielding maniac <laughs> run through your your company or whatever <laughs> i i don't think we're show. ready to do applied research on that one yet <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so free coffees yes but mm -hmm. uh, axe wielding maniacs yeah. No, we'll li limit it there. Okay. <laughs> um, look, our final part of, of the show, we, um, we we give you a mural board with which outlines the some of the topics we're going to we're discuss. And uh, you very kindly um, engaged in a little bit of a creative act. It's called our um, our Mad Lib. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna share our screen, and we're gonna go through this. And it's a, it's in relation to um, again a variety of topics. There, I'm just going to show our viewers, sorry, listeners, but like there's a variety of different Mad Libs and they're partially completed. And then, you know, lots of li little Lego images. And then you complete the Mad Lib uh, relative to the Lego figures that you think are appropriate. So here, 
Can you can you 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 can see that first and foremost? Yeah. 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 Will you talk us through all of that? You can read it out and then talk about the association you've made with the little figure. Yeah. So I I took the the so the the green post-it here that said I hope readers take away from a research research that, uh, and then I sort of put in that the fun of play is a signal that children and adults, you might add, uh, are learning uh, or at least dealing somehow uh, with a situation better or faster than they initially thought. So, And that's and again comes back to what we talked about earlier, this idea that you're sort of surprising yourself with your own efficiency. Uh, and that has the function of Im improving your action repertoire uh, going forward. Um, because then play would be taken as seriously as it deserves. I love it. And and yeah. so the association with the little uh, rocking people, we're going to have to get terms for these, but the bottom one, then play would take in a series. But what does that mean to you? Two people sitting on a kind of like a rocking chair type of thing or or seesaw. Seesaw. Yeah, seesaw. Like... yeah I'm way off. Mm -hmm. Rocking chair. I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, it's, it's, it's again going back to that idea that you know, that sort of, you know, concepts that people uh, automatically think of when they hear play, they, they you know, they, they, they might think of, you know, well, that's two kids on a, on a seesaw in the garden. It has nothing to do with, with you know, say being in, uh, in a classroom, mm. uh, but, but it has everything to do <laughs> with being in the classroom because, uh, you know, on the one hand, we know from, if you look at developmental psychology, you will see all the time uh, that children being described as neophilic uh, neophiles, they love new stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but why is it then that in, in at least in some formal schoolings that kids report being bored out of their mind when they are, when they're there, right? There's plenty of new information there uh, that's kind of but if kids love information that much then why don't they always just love being you know at school and i think it, it it's because we don't take into account um you know first of all the estimate of how how they 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 expect to to um to to encounter a surprise but also that it is it is you know formal schooling can oftentimes be um, you know, really lacking that agency that that kids need to 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 on their own find what is to them a moderate amount of pushback from the world. Um, and so, so I, so I and many colleagues, and uh, I bet you a lot of uh, educational professionals as well would like to see that uh, change, right? That to 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 let play back into the um, into the classroom and not just in the in the you know schoolyard. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, for for us as well, we we try and do as much uh, pro bono work, uh, specifically around the education system, to try and bring in e either Lego series play, the structured formal method, or just elements of that. Um, it is an important part of of our existence as a company. Um, yeah, because I remember being a bored kid and not learning like. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. and again, it's the system, the education system is, it's filled with m amazing people who are highly committed. So it's not a, certainly not a critique, yeah. um, certainly um, maybe the consideration of, if you were asking kids of any age, would you like to learn or conceptualize any concept through mm -hmm. Lego? I don't think any of them are going to go, no, that wouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think they'll all want that. So maybe you have a bit more of a child centered mm -hmm. view of, of learning. Yeah. Now, your second Mad Lib. Again, I'll let you take it away. I think I'll zoom out slightly. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so this one starts off with one piece of advice that I would like to give our listeners is um, be more willing to let your children experience child-led risk, nervousness, fear, etc., and be less protective of children. And that goes back to you know, something we haven't talked a lot about. We've mentioned risky play a few times, but and also the whole idea of playing with fear. So the idea is that, so we have colleagues um, in the UK uh, and in Norway that, you know, are, are really pushing uh, this idea that risky play is really important 
for children to engage with. And it's important because risky play is typically that unsupervised form of play where children engage with, you know, activities where they become nervous or they become scared sometimes, sometimes sad. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they really experience challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also rewarding, uh, which is something that, you know, that might signify that they're getting something out of it, right? Um, and so, so we think that, that what is that, that one of the things that ha- that's happening is that when you when children playfully engage with fear and nervousness and all these things that we traditionally think of as you know bad emotions or thing, emotions that 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 you should stay stay away from what they are actually doing is that they are learning about their they are learning about their emotions they're learning how it feels to be scared but in a situation where it doesn't cause you know, mental trauma. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's so so that's why it's so crucial to to expose kids to all of these. Um, and I mean, if we think about it, we do that to ourselves all the time as well, right? We also watch scary movies or we watch sad movies, right? Um, so feeling negative emotions can be very enjoyable, and it can be something that you can really learn a lot from. Unfortunately, we know that risky play is uh, is really and has been for many years on the decline because parents um, worry that their children will get hurt and so they shield them uh, not only from physical injury but also increasingly from um, from from you could say like um, mental sensations that 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 might feel unpleasant and that um, is something that a Quite a few developmental psychologists uh, believe is a really bad uh, move. If you are a parent, it's a really good thing to to let kids uh, get exposed to, you know, the the whole negative spectrum of emotions as well, uh, especially or if it is something where you know the kids have when it's age appropriate and when it's child led, when it's something the kids want to do, it's something that that also gives them a kick. At the same time as it as it pushes uh, them back, and I think that's something where we can really work on uh, on the culture we we're currently in. Yeah, and we, we were again. I'm going to throw a curveball at you, but we we were chatting. Jane is a PhD in entrepreneurship. I'm going to synthesize that quickly. But like you spent many years, degree, masters, PhD, uh, researching entrepreneurship, and and um, so we we were talking about um, in terms of risky play when when we're talking to our dads. Uh, you know, they're now in their 60s-ish, ish, maybe a little bit more. Um, their childhood was was filled with risky play. And like it was the it was like you said, it was play, it wasn't risky, it was just normal. It wasn't mm-hmm. wild swimming, it was Rough swimming. And tumble, yeah. Like it was absolutely normal. And and I suppose our kind of view of 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 excessive parenting, um, I mean, even to think about excessive parenting, you wouldn't want to be micromanaged in the workplace. Yeah. But, nor would you want to be micromanaged as a kid. That's as a side point. But this lack of of risky play or just play for for kids nowadays, all the conversations I have with a lot of my dad's friends, they're entrepreneurs, and they're entrepreneurs. But they, for me, because tracking this like youth leading into a sense of identity as as an adult, um, they talk about fishing and these crazy stories and like you name it they've done it in your classical huckleberry finn-esque kind of childhood and and they weren't risk averse then as they weren't risk averse and i think it translates into i'm gonna throw the curveball at you what do you think mark anderson about it going into a sense of of risk as an entrepreneur like do you think it could inhibit literally innovation future innovation because you don't have this implicit embodied uh sense of agency and also risk aversion you're like more you have a higher propensity to risk we're ending on a tough question i'm (laughs) sorry but it's a really interesting question if you know if uh, if exposure to risk um in a you could say a a, a manner that you could learn from is something that would um increase risk taking propensity uh, as an adult uh, I don't know. I don't know, uh, but, uh, Aww. Aww. but but I know that there are uh, a few people now that have um, you know argued that the the lack of risky play in childhood uh, might explain some of the um, 
the mental health issues that we see increasingly happen uh, with um, with kids um, these days, where the idea is that that if you don't practice these feelings, um, if you don't practice coping strategies, if you don't, if you're not exposed to the world, um, then at some point, it can be really hard to to deal with either those emotions or those scenarios or, or those situations when you uh, when you encounter them. So 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 there, there are arguments out there uh, now sort of claiming that, you know, that un, unsupervised risky forms of play are, are crucial to to mental health um, mm. as such, uh, because of the idea sort of being that um, you know, being feeling safe, mm-hmm. be feeling uh, feeling good, uh, safe in the world, is not about placing yourself in an environment that is absent of danger. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's really about being competent in dealing with whatever unpredictable, you know, stuff the world is going to throw at you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there's sort of a, a competence component there in some sense, certainly. It's definitely a really interesting piece of research. Let's put a call out to any future budding researchers. This could be a PhD. <laughs> um, but no, it would be definitely very interesting to to see if there is that correlation. Yeah. Definitely. Um, okay, I think the curveball worked out relatively mm-hmm. okay. It's a curiosity. <laughs> uh, Mark, again, thank you so much for being you know, on the Seeking Play podcast. You've been fantastic, Mark. It's been so great. Thank you. It was a, a true pleasure. <laughs> enjoy the rest of the danish summer thank you and uh, i hope you enjoy the irish summer as well oh well <laughs> stay tuned <laughs> it's an oxymoron <laughs> thank bye, you Mark. so much Mark. Bye-bye. Take care. see you later